developed and established various approaches to teaching academic literacy, drawing on the King's Apprentice Writing Corpus for, create, for the creating of international, for instructional resources in different disciplines. Her publications focus on various approaches to academic instruction, the impact of formative feedback on academic writing, and the teaching and learning of argumentation. In her recent book, Academic Literacy and Student Diversity, The Case for Inclusive Practice, Ursula promotes a <clears throat> curriculum integrated collaborative model of academic literacy instruction that is inclusive to students from all backgrounds. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ursula Wingate. Thank you. Thank you for the for the very nice introduction. I have to move very carefully here because I've, I'm so wired up. I, I'm worried that something falls down. So um, first of all, many thanks to the conference organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here today and talk to you. And it's always very nice for me to come home to Hong Kong. So as you can see from my title, um, I, my topic is what my topic normally is, academic literacy and how we can help students new to university to develop their academic literacy. Then there is this word towards, which signals that I'm still on the move, that I'm still working towards um, the approach which I think is the most effective and appropriate, which is the what I call the collaborative curriculum integrated approach to academic literacy instruction. And I'm taking you on a journey today. Sorry, this is a, um, a little bit on and off this microphone. I hope you can hear me all right. So I'm taking you on a journey of my thinking about initially academic writing and my research into academic writing and then academic literacy that I've done over the last 10 years, including some initiatives um, to test, to implement and um, to implement and evaluate uh, certain approaches. And I want to share with you what I have learned uh, and actually why I'm talking about academic literacy and why I promote um, the curriculum integrated approach to teaching it. So I have to lay the ground first and um, explain to you what I understand by academic literacy. I will then um, show you some different types, different approaches to instruction. Um, several of them uh, I have tried out. Um, and then I talk about the initiatives um, we have, the projects we have carried out at King's College London. And I raise to finish off the question, how can we achieve um, curriculum integration? So <clears throat> first about academic literacy. Why am I not talking like most of my colleagues in the field about academic writing? Because, um, but why do I talk about academic literacy? Now, academic literacy is much more than academic writing. And um, it is the, basically the ability that a novice student, a novice to a discipline, has to develop to be able to communicate competently in an academic discourse community. I'm using John Swale's words here, academic discourse community, which actually means a specific discipline or field. And this is not just a language issue, but it is an issue of understanding. <laughs> just being given just another microphone. <laughs> um, is there anybody who can't hear me? Um, is it OK? Thank you. Um, so it involves understanding the discipline's epistemology, how is knowledge constructed, debated, and presented. It uh, involves understanding and then being able to use a discipline's genres. So m disciplines are in, in academia, the majority of genres are written genres, but there is also there are also the spoken genres. So basically, 
Um, acquiring academic literacy means that a student learns to read, reason, present, debate, and write, and writing is only part of it at university. And that means that um, academic literacy is a learning requirement for all students, regardless of their English language proficiency. So if we have in the UK a native, what we call native speaker student, someone who is born and grew up with the, in, in an English environment, this person needs to acquire academic literacy as much as your uh, L2 learners with whom you deal here in the Hong Kong context. And this, I, 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 don't, think, uh, I don't think there is a problem um, this is microphone number five, I think. <laughs> so um, the other implication is, of course, that this kind of learning of academic literacy cannot take place outside the academic discourse community. However, and now I speak particularly about the situation in the UK. I know that things are better here in Hong Kong, um, and I come back to that at the end. But in England, um, we have at many universities, um, universities still a clear divide um, between native speakers and non-native speakers. So support is, or I hate to use this word actually, but support is only available for what we brand international students who are assumed to be non-native speakers of English. So for them, there is an English language center where they can go and get specific language support. There is at most universities nothing for what we call home students, the so-called native speakers. Um, never, um, I mean, the, the, regardless of the fact that many of our home students come from ethnic minorities and English is by no means their first language, and regardless of the fact that many international students who come to British universities are very privileged because they went to some fancy international school in their home place and speak English and manage English better than many of our home students. Still, our provision is extracurricular, targeted at specific student groups, um, focused on linguistic issues mainly, and um, focused on writing. And this problem, uh, that the focus on writing is um, clearly, clearly um, much too narrow. Because if we think about what is involved in writing an academic assignment, then we know that teaching academic writing only is not enough. Because several, there are several steps in the literacy process that ends up in the written pro uh, uh, product. There is, first of all, the student's subject knowledge and the understanding of the topic or the essay question. Then, and that's very complex and difficult for many students, there is the literature search, identifying what's relevant. For most students, particularly novice students, there is an information overload. At a mouse click, they get so much so many sources, but then finding out which source is relevant for my assignment topic is very complex. Once they have identified sources, how to evaluate what in these sources is actually can be, can be used for the argument is very difficult. And then putting together from different sources information into my own position, developing my own position, um, developing my own argument is also uh, a very demanding, um, very challenging. And the last step then is the actual writing, presenting the argument in a logical, coherent manner. And the uh, kind of instruction we offer at universities, at least in the UK, is only focused on the last step of a complex process. So basically, this is not good enough, just focusing on writing. What are the implications of this complex process that students have to go through? Uh, the implications are that students need to be at least once at the beginning of their university study 
need to be guided through the whole literacy process. Someone has to explain to them how to search for information, how to eliminate what is not relevant, um, how to bring arguments together and so on. And then comes perhaps the language work, how to present um, what I have brought together into my argument in coherent writing. The guidance for the first steps of the literacy process needs to be specific to the subject and to the assignment topic, which means that we can't just do language lessons in a central unit. Um, some instruction needs to be integrated into the curriculum. So uh, we are talking here about an integrated development of subject knowledge and academic literacy because the two are inseparable. Um, and that means that a certain responsibility for academic literacy instruction needs to be placed on the subject lecturer. And this is the tricky thing <laughs> because um, academic literacy instruction is not something subject le lecturers want to know about. Although they, they are the actual, actual literacy experts in their disciplines, they publish and write all the time. And many do provide some kind of implicit support for their students, but this needs to be more systematic. Um, academic literacy instruction needs to be integrated into the regular teaching and assessment duties of subject lecturers. However, uh, and you all probably collaborate and deal with academics and the disciplines, and you know that there is a reluctance to have anything to do with language or literacy. Um, and this is mainly because people think I'm an expert in, say, um, textiles or engineering, but I'm not, a, a, as one of my interviewees said, an English language expert. Um, it is not about English language. It's about communication, communicating knowledge. Um, also, um, subject lecturers often have only a tacit knowledge, an implicit knowledge of the literacy conventions of their discipline. They, they can do it, but they can't teach it. And that's where the collaboration comes in. Because in my view, if more EAP staff, experts were working closely with subject lecturers and were even attached to departments, the more they could help subject lecturers to fulfill their responsibility um, to teach academic literacy. Now, I'm talking about my journey, as I announced at the beginning, um, which started a good 10 years ago, where I really moved, uh, or tried to move from generic to discipline specific, to developing discipline specific teaching materials. Um, um, I moved from thinking about academic writing to literacy, a much more holistic uh, uh, concept. And I try to move in the projects I have carried out to um, move from minimal to fuller collaboration with myself uh, as an EAP expert and subject lecturers. So I'm showing you now various types of EAP academic literacy instruction. So when you see the left column where it says extracurricular, that was my starting point. Um, and 10 years ago, um, this extracurricular provision, where, which is remedial, where people with problems and the non-native speakers were sent to a central unit, an English language unit, to be fixed, to be helped by EAP experts and uh, subject lecturers didn't want to have anything to do with this business. So that's the starting point. I moved then to additional, and this is basically not only what I've done, the three categories of additional curriculum linked and curriculum integrated. I'm reporting that because I know this is very much the work that you are doing all the time, and you, your work will be 
in the columns, uh, in the area additional curriculum linked and to some extent perhaps curriculum in integrated. So additional means um, that we develop discipline specific, so that's a step up from extracurricular, discipline specific resources for uh, certain study programs, um, something like online courses for independent learning um, and or print materials for students to learn by themselves. It could be guidelines, it could be online courses. I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, this work would be done by ELP experts with a little input from subject lecturers. Curriculum linked is the next step and better. And I've done a project in each of these areas. That's why I'm going into this detail. So here we are talking about a timetabled provision um, where students are being given workshops on academic literacies. So they are designated teaching sessions um, delivered jointly by EAP and uh, teachers and subject lecturers. And there is a kind of equal contribution um, to the design and delivery of these workshops. And lastly, and this is where I think universities should move to in the future, is the proper curriculum integration where English academic literacy is, time to, uh, is part of an assessed part of subject teaching. So an assessed component of content modules um, where the subject lecturer is in the driving seat and has the main responsibility for the academic literacy instruction, but because that's necessary, heavily supported by EAP experts. Um, so the EAP experts' role is actually to give input into this kind of uh, instructional provision and advise the subject lecturer because that's the EAP expert has the expertise to ad advise on language and literacy issues. So, what's coming next? Now, I'm talking about these three projects I've run in the last um, 10 years, over the, in the course of the last 10 years. Um, the first additional, so I, I started and learned and the next project was always based on what I had learned in the previous project. So I started quite naively by developing kind of additional provision and I developed discipline specific online academic writing courses. At this stage I was focused entirely on academic writing for two programs. One was business management, the other one was classics. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Basically because I had a collaboration with kind of collaboration with academics in these disciplines. <clears throat> the second one is curriculum linked. Um, I developed genre-based writing instruction, still at the level of writing only for four different disciplines. And lastly, I had an attempt at integrating um, academic literacy into my own teaching in the area of applied linguistics, because that's what's, what's my main job. Um, so, let's have a look at these initiatives. Um, briefly, the theoretical underpinnings. So, I'm a strong believer that um, students learn best um, to manage to use genres by analyzing them. So, uh, genre analysis underpins everything I'm doing. Um, and I follow um, the EAP uh, in, in the tradition of John Swales and the Sydney School. So systemic functional linguistics approach both give me useful tools to develop materials. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in tomorrow's workshop. Um, so genre analysis means that um, first I, as the one who prepares the materials, identify um, specific language and discourse features. <laughs> in, uh, I have to hold this up as well. I, it's okay, I think. Um, uh, in the genres, the text examples I get from, I have, have it in my hand, is that okay? Or, yeah, or do you want to fix it? Uh, I think it's fine. Okay. Um, to, and, and then get students to do genre analysis. And I'll show you the examples in a moment. Um, in terms of learning, um, I 
I, my, all my, all, everything I'm doing is underpinned by um, social con constructivist um, learning theories. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, language social socialization, this theory uh, looks, uh, uh, explains learning by novices being assisted by expert members of the community. Um, and the CLP, uh, community of practice model, takes the same approach. So, um, with my model of curriculum integration, it is the subject lecturer, the professor who is the expert and who would help and gradually um, help the novice in the discipline, the students to become more and more expert in academic literacy. So that's basically what uh, uh, underpins my teaching approaches. So briefly about this online courses I developed and I can just say at the beginning, um, in hindsight it was quite a flop. Um, so what happened there was that our management department is one of the big earners at the university. So they bring in big money and so they enhance, their, they increase their student numbers. And about 10 years ago, they suddenly had an intake of 180 students every year. But with this intake, although they highly select their students, diversity, there was more diversity and more problems. So students complained and the writing didn't go well and the grades were low. And at this point, they approached me and said, what can we do? And I said, well, you need to, do, do you do any teaching? Do you explain anything to them with writing? No, we sent them to the English Language Center. But uh, the English Language Center mainly takes only international students, but there were problems everywhere. So I was thinking hard and then applied for funding to develop for this and another subject classics um, online materials. And I invested um, a lot of work. We had great technicians who developed this course. Um, and the subject lecturers with whom I worked, there were two of them who were in charge of the first year and had to deal with all these problems, were ever so glad that they could hand their problem over to me and I thought wonders would happen now. Um, but they did contribute text. I asked them for subject specific materials. So very briefly, the course components were five, one, two, three, four. So there were two case studies to alert students, case studies of students starting out to write at university, to alert students to possible problems, alert students to the fact that things can be negotiated, that things can be discussed with the subject tutor, um, that they should pay attention to feedback and so on. And I thought that was great. At this time, I was very much uh, influenced by academic literacies and critical EAP, and I thought I should start this online course with making them aware, critically aware of what's going on at university. As you will see in a moment, students didn't find that particularly great. Um, then um, I worked, um, I had a journal article in management which was not too complex, written by one of the um, collaborators and students had to identify features of academic writing in there. So um, what, what is specific about this journal article in comparison to what you usually read. Um, and this was all interactive and online and I could get model answers and so on. Um, the next step was that I had gotten a long list of tutor feedbacks together with uh, feedback comments together with grades. And the students um, had to basically relate the comments to the grade and then come up with a list of criteria of what is good in management writing. The next step was that they applied the criteria. Um, they were asked to make comments, give comments on uh, sample student essays. And the last thing was actually technically quite interesting because there was an interactive practice element where students had to put paragraphs into text and um, uh, use tables and figures correctly. And so, so I thought for my part, this was actually a, a very nice program. Let's see what happened to it. So this is what, this is, is what it looked like. We then had a rather clunky and awkward blackboard system and the technicians, um, 
managed to create a, a very nice and, and interactive tool. But what happened? First of all, um, the students, um, so the first cohort started working with that in 2008. Um, uh, the students got a questionnaire, what they thought about it. Um, 92, which is almost, it's more than 50% responded. They found, and this is like a thread through all my work, they're like most these student essays. Examples of other students' writing. That's the best thing you can do to your students. They liked the journal articles, and they didn't like my wonderful case studies very much. <laughs> so much about bringing, you know, some critical thinking um, to the students. That didn't help very much. However, what happened to the program? Um, in 2008, when it's launched, I volunteered to give an introductory session to the students. They were all there. It was during induction week. They were hands-on. They all logged in. Um, and so 100% log in. They worked with it. And there was then, so I could monitor that, a, a, a subsequent logs in, logins were going down to 28.5%. So only less than a third went back to work. That tells you something. Um, and in 2009, I said to the management department, look, I'm not your servant. I can't do your int introduction every year. You take it on now. So that meant the total downfall of this online program. Because what happened then, they couldn't be bothered. Um, they were very happy um, for me to develop it and, and introduce it to the students, but they couldn't be bothered. So what happened was that, and I know that from student interviews, uh, um, that uh, a management lecturer would, you know, mention this program briefly in induction week, and that was it. And then when students really struggled, then they were told, oh, by the way, there is this good online program. You should use that, and then you will know how to write. So. Basically, um, it ended because, yeah, it, it didn't end well when I think about all the effort I put into it. The limitations were there was no link to the subject teaching. There was a lack of interest and involvement by the subject lecturers, and that means students won't be interested either. Then it be becomes irrelevant. So uh, some students I interviewed um, talked about an, it's an add-on to all the work we have already got to do. Uh, it's not as relevant um, as our timetabled modules, and also the lecturers obviously don't think much of it. So that was the end of this approach, and I wouldn't, um, did, I think that it, it kept online um, for a few more years, but I didn't monitor, monitor it anymore. So that's the way of, um, this is how, how not to do it. Um, so that started off the second initiative. And I thought, well, we must create something that has to do with student text. So that's what I learned from the first initiative. And we must do something that is timetable and that shows the presence of the subject lecturer. Um, so what I did then is um, I got another round of funding um, for the collaboration um, with four disciplines, I, that's exaggerated, with three disciplines. Applied linguistics is myself, that, that's my discipline, and this um, was a kind of pilot. We started uh, our development of genre-based discipline-specific materials and um, subsequent workshops in my own department with our master's students, and then um, worked with our contacts in the subjects of pharmacy history and uh, management again. Uh, so, what did we do? Um, we collected, and this was mentioned by you when you introduced me, um, in the King's Apprentice Writing Workshop, we collected student text in our own discipline, and we got the collaborators to contribute. So in history, we actually had 3,000 scripts, which is a fantastic, is fantastic for a corpus. In pharmacy and management, it was diff uh, uh, there were fewer texts, but um, enough to work with. What we ask our collaborators is to give us high-achieving and low-achieving assignments. Um, 
because that's the comparison students need, with grade and, if possible, with comments. So for us to make sense of pharmacy te texts, student texts, we need it. Um, for our own genre analysis, we needed the grade, the comments, to see what is required in this writing, what are the expected discourse features. And we also had to go back, of course, like to the pharmacy lecturer and consult and confirm to be able to develop these materials. So that's what we did as EAP experts. We analyzed in the four disciplines, we analyzed good and bad student text um, and then prepared a pack of materials that were uh, consequently uh, used in um, workshops. And the workshops were jointly delivered by us as EAP um, specialists and the subject lecturer had to be present as well. Um, now, I mentioned the Sydney School before just to say that our model for the workshops was the teaching. We, we followed the teaching learning cycle developed by the Sydney School, which means, and I keep this brief, we started with the phase of deconstruction. That means that we never ever in our workshops told the students anything, like this is what you have to do and what you have to do. We don't believe in prescriptive teaching. The students had to do the work themselves. They had a pack of materials, they worked in groups, and um, they had to identify genre features by themselves. So that's what we call um, deconstruction. They deconstructed text exemplars. The next phase was joint construction. So for every workshop, we asked the students to bring the, their own text they were working on currently. So we timed the workshops that they fell into the period when a, as an assignment or the relevant genre was just being produced by the students. So they brought their own materials and helped each other to change things from what they had learned through their own genre analysis. And then the last phase, independent construction, we hoped they would go home and apply what they had uh, learned in the workshop. Now, um, what did we do in the deconstruction phase? The students had a work pack with three high-scoring text examples in which we provided a commentary which was a kind, which is a move analysis. What's going on in this section of the essay? So we had, we, we produced a commentary with our genre or move analysis for the students to discuss. And when they see three high scoring text examples with comments, they figure out what's expected in this type of, of genre or subgenre. Then they had to fill in a, write a commentary for another high achieving good example. And then we had a discussion usually. So we would ask the students, so if you had to teach about this genre, what would you recommend? Just to check whether they got it. And then, and this was always the moment of great joy for the students, they were given two low scoring, so really bad examples of work. And they always said that this comparison really helped them to understand what is expected. I'll show you a um, few examples more about this tomorrow uh, in my workshop. So this is for management. Um, so this, I won't go into details about this genre. It, it was a critique that the students had to write. And so uh, I explain more tomorrow just to show that the text paragraph by paragraph is on the left. Our analysis is in the middle column, but we also had the uh, tutor comments scribbled in the margin, so we gave them as well. Um, so for the students to see what, what, how did we analyze the text and what did the tutors say. And they found that highly effective. So um, in this case, it was only, a, I think, a 1,500 or 2,000 word uh, assignment. We, we worked with the whole assignment. As you see next in applied linguistics, here was a workshop where we looked at introductions and conclusions. And here in the introduction, you see our comment is a move analysis. So we say something like this section establishes the intellectual context. The next move is now 
the essay is focusing on the issue or problem uh, that will be discussed. And the la last move in an introduction is to provide an outline, a map through the writing. So if they have seen that in several assignments and have written their own commentary, they, um, they will never forget what to do in an introduction. Now, I show you how we evaluated this work in the four disciplines. First of all, after every workshop, we gave students a questionnaire and we got highly positive comments. The students really loved that. And just to say one thing, what was most important for them was not only that us EAP guys were there, but that the subject lecturer was there for the whole workshop because that was basically the only chance they ever got to so ask the subject lecturer about the assignment. So bad as the situation. So basically, us, in pharmacy, there were two of us EAP guys because it was just a very alien discipline to us. And the lecturer were there for the entire workshops. And we were very, very busy because students had their discussions, but they would ask questions, they would discuss things with us. So, so to make sure that they really learn something through the working, to the materials and our comments, we audio recorded the group work of several groups in the deconstruction phase. And we, in the next phase, the joint construction, when they made changes to their own text, we asked them to track changes. So we had a fantastic opportunity here to see what was going on, what did they learn, learn what impact did it make on their text? Um, we looked at students' final text and um, we had a, f a number of student interviews basically to get ideas where we could change things and where students saw room for improvement. So here's an example from the audio recording, um, one uh, evaluation method. So the student one, that was... Uh, related to the MOVE analysis in applied linguistics, the work on introductions. So one student says, oh, the framework of A, B, and C, these are the three high-achieving um, uh, exemplars, you have to set the academic context and cite enough reference to prove the academic background, and then the problem you want to focus on. And the second student says, and then there is the map to show the reader how I'm going to address the problem. So it's exactly really what we wanted them to learn. And as you can see, um, they made changes. So this is from the track changes. They made changes accordingly to their own text. Um, so previously, as you see in the second col column, the writer was saying right at the beginning what he or she was going to do in this paper without laying the ground. Yeah? So this would be unusual. Um, it would probably be not well received by the um, assessor. So the necessary changes here were made. And through our analysis of more student texts, we could see um, that the students had learned what they were supposed to learn in the workshops. So the evaluation results are students highly appreciate, here we are again, working with student text. They liked the commentary, they liked the fact that they worked independently in groups, um, and they liked very much that both EAP and subject lecturer were in the room. Um, we compared also the results of the first assignment um, in the Applied Linguistics group, we're talking here about 40 students in the first round, with, pre with the results of previous cohorts, but we could not establish a significant difference. That's a bit disappointing. But then there were only 40 students, and there are more factors, of course, impacting on writing. So, oh, yeah, it's just one participant wrote to us and just pointed out this person had just been to the, an international student, to the English unit, uh, to get some kind of general uh, academic writing courses. One's, one was called Principles of Academic Writing, and the second one was called Writing Critically. And she, as you can see, she thinks um, these courses were well done, but very general, and not nearly as helpful as the workshops designed 
uh, specifically for our course. So there is a, a high level of student appreciation of this approach. The limitations uh, are that we're still only focusing on writing. Uh, this does nothing for reading and all these steps that precede the actual text production. There is a high participation, but um, it's not, it's voluntary. Um, so we have hold these workshops and we have found that always more than 70, almost around 80% of the student cohorts come. So you see there is a need, but it's not inclusive in the sense that it really brings all students in and we don't know whether those who are most needy of this kind of support are too hard pressed uh, to come to these workshops. And then uh, what do I have to say about collaboration? That is a dismal uh, um, chapter really. Um, we collaborated with the subject lecturers, but basically we got I got funding to pay them. And I had to chase and chase and chase and chase. And if I hadn't uh, given them, or had to, if they hadn't the prospect of me, me giving them 600 pounds for a laptop at the end of the project, I would have become very embarrassed. But so um, it, is, it is very difficult to collaborate um, with academics and the disciplines and keep them going. Um, so. This brought me to my third initiative, and this is where I always wanted to be. Um, in 2011 or 12, I can't remember now, we integrated academic literacy instruction into a module that I teach every year. Um, this is in our uh, BA language and English language and communication. Um, I integrated academic literacy instru instruction into this first year, first term module. This is when students arrive. This is the time when they have to learn about academic literacy. So in that year, we had 60 students, and I had two other lecturers supporting me. They helped um, with the feedback. And well, I did all the teaching, but they helped with the feedback. Um, so this was the initiative where we did academic literacy instruction, not just only writing. So let's see what we did there. So the students had, from the first week onwards, they had to read text related, so this is what we call pre-reading, related to the topic of the next lecture. And they had to write a summary online and submit, and I would look at it. You can think of my workload, it was horrible. But I wanted to pick, first of all, make them read, taking away the fear of reading academic text from the first week, and I wanted to make them write. And um, I gave small comments, which was a hell of a lot of work with 60 students, when I picked up serious problems with writing from the beginning. Then we had discussion and writing tasks in class. Group discussions at the end of a lecture on a topic, on the topic, and then they had to write up a summary of their discussion just to get them writing and point out from the beginning what is expected, what type of writing is expected. We did explicit teaching of, or I did explicit teaching of argumentation in class. Um, I used the Tulmin model uh, that was uh, mentioned by Anthony this morning, um, just to make clear, to show them that every claim has to be backed up by evidence. Um, I had so often read in first year assignments on this course statements um, like, I believe all English people are rubbish at languages. <laughs> so just to, from the beginning, to make absolutely clear that something like that cannot be said. I believe is dodgy in academic writing. And if there's no evidence, don't make the statement. So this is what we, did in class as part of the uh, regular subject teaching. And I used text examples related to the topic to show discourse features of applied linguistics and formative assessment. And that was really the killer. We gave a lot of formative assessment. And um, I must say, 
I got some funding here, but this is something I could have never done without research assistant help and teaching assistant help. So this is complex, and I don't know whether I have enough time. But what I basically, what we did is, we had a module running in parallel, language and communication. So in the first few weeks, students got feedback, online feedback on the short writing task. They were supposed to use this feedback for their first assignment in the other module. In the meantime, in week four, students had to write a 1,000 word, uh, word exploratory essay for which they got face-to-face -face and written feedback, um, which then could be used for their final assignment. So we hoped that the students would take this feedback in to use, so you see it's, um, to use it for consecutive assignments. So it was all very, very carefully planned. Um, but of course, we don't know how much no notice students took of the feedback. What I do know was that it was an absolute killer in terms of time investment. Um, so, um, evaluation. Our question was, how did students evaluate the different components of the academic literacy embedded instruction. Main question, is the approach feasible? In terms of lecture workload, I can tell you now the answer is no. And it's about covering subject content, what is the impact on student writing? So the methods for evaluation were tutor, our own notes, my colleagues, my two colleagues in my notes, and interviews with my two colleagues who were involved in the um, assessment, comparing student performance with previous cohorts, and student questionnaire and interviews. So the results are students love the face-to-face -face formative feedback. Of course, that's what we cannot deliver in our normal, you know, um, workloads allow allowance. They loved, and here we are again, the analysis of other students' text, which was part of our classroom um, activity. Um, and yeah, the rest is not so important. Feasibility and impact. Um, feasibility, you can't do this kind of thing to tutors. We worked very, very hard, but for workload issues, you can't do this on a regular basis unless this kind of initiative is heavily supported by, in other subjects, EAP experts who help with feedback and other issues. And five minutes, I will finish in five minutes. Um, and, um, and unless there are incentives by senior management. Otherwise, it's impossible. Impact, that's interesting. There was a significant improvement in the, final, in the results of the final assignment uh, compared with previous students. And here we had a number of 60. So statistically, that was a sound finding. And ever since, I have maintained that this is the best approach and a holistic approach to helping students to, within the first term, develop some good level of academic literacy. Uh, so my conclusions are, as I just said, the high evaluation, student evaluation of working with other students' text means we need to do this kind of work. This is helpful. And once you develop this kind of resources that I've shown you, they run for a long time because often assignments don't change much over years. So it's a worthwhile investment, highly appreciated by students. Um, and the other conclusion is only the curriculum integrated approach led to significant improvement in student performance. So we should do this, but ordinary subject lecturers who are not applied linguists like I, but maybe work in engineering, can't do this without serious support from EAP experts. So how do we get there? And I'm coming to my um, last two sli a few slides, and I will finish in time. Ideally, university management would understand the benefits of this approach and what it does for an inclusive, um, you know, literacy education for, for, for students and would facilitate this change and this would, would cost them money because it's resource intensive. 
If they had any sense, they would go this route. However, in the meantime, we have to do bottom-up initiatives. So how about university management facilitating change? What would they need to do? They would have to make structural changes to give EAP staff a higher standing in the university, making them um, equal teaching partners in departments. Um, that doesn't mean that there are no central units anymore. It doesn't mean that there is no language work anymore. But EAP specialists could do wonders if they were attached to departments and would support lecturers, um, helping them to integrate um, or to, to um, do academic literacy teaching as part of their regular teaching and assessment uh, duties. Um, this has happened over a decade ago in the late 1990s in the University of Wollongong. And to my, exam uh, my knowledge, this is the only example where EAP lecturers are attached to departments. And it has, from the, judging from the publications, it has been very successful. Um, and university management would also have to give serious incentives to subject lecturers. For instance, that would mean giving them the time allocation to do this kind of stuff and consider good teaching when it comes to promotion. This is not the case at the moment. Now, is this likely to happen? I don't think so, because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, cost intensive, resource intensive, and university managements, at least in the UK, change all the time because these guys in management, they're always find an even more highly paid job elsewhere. So I'm not interested in long-term uh, improvements that are costly. So what do we do in the meantime? We do bottom-up initiatives. I have done one at King's College, and I will finish, in fact, that's my last slide. Um, I have um, managed to integrate um, an academic literacy development module into our teacher training course. So this is the uh, postgraduate certificate of academic practice that all young lecturers have to do. I offer an option module and yeah, people come and uh, I show them ways of how they can help students develop academic literacy without additional work, but just as by doing their own work better, more effectively. Um, we could train more PhD students to become academic literacy advisors. I'm involved into this kind of work as well. Um, PhD students offering one-to-one -one advice sessions. These are our future academics. Let them know now when they're PhD students what they can do to help students to become academic lit academically literate. And then I think in the UK we just have to look at the good example of Hong Kong, like this fantastic pro project, English Across the Curriculum, that has been running now for, for many years, whereas Julia is there. Um, so I have read and heard a lot about the excellent work here, how EAP experts here in Hong Kong universities reach out to the, uh, to the departments. Um, I was just spent a week at the Chinese University uh, of Hong Kong and was very, very impressed about a large number of um, close collaborations they have facilitated with a range of um, departments um, where they really um, make, created tailor-made initiatives to help students in these departments. So that is fantastic work and I think we in the UK have to speed up and, and follow your example and thinking about the good work here I feel that, like for the last hour, I have been preaching to the converted. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much for sharing your project findings with us this afternoon. So we have some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I'm on my way. Oh, <laughs> run! <laughs> I've got. Um...
representational language, there is, you can't really comment on the content as much. I mean, you barely understand the undergraduate work than high level secondary <coughs> So, how do you actually balance the, the, the interest of both the subject matters as well as the PhD? You know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, of course, they have to cover content. And what they need to be aware, made aware of is that content is actually communicated often by the written text, by the spoken text, but often also by the written text. So what I've um, tried to explain to lecturers in different disciplines is how they can use short literacy windows in their lecture where they just show um, how a certain point is presented in, in publications. And just uh, let students discuss this. Um, I have actually done it, and I'm doing it in my own teaching all the time, but I've done it with other lecturers. And uh, this is also raising students' awareness of how is knowledge debated and presented in writing? What are the specific features? So we have to first alert the subject lecturers uh, um, to the fact that language is part, and content can't be separated. Language is the vehicle to communicate the content. And just paying more attention to this vehicle. I don't know whether I answered this very well. It sounds so simple, but it's very difficult to convince subject lecturers. write very well, but it doesn't mean the content is not communicated well if they're in the like I guess the discourse community. So they can use keywords just like they you know, Yes. Yes. You know, I know too little about some disciplines. For instance, I've never worked with engineering or have worked very little with STEM subjects. And it might be quite possible that in some of these areas, the elegance of communication is not important. And keywords, it is possible. And unfortunately, I can't really say much about it. Um, if I have enough lifetime left, I want to look um, at technology technology subjects to see what's going on there. I'm sure you, you have a point there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid time is up. Uh, again, thank you very much okay, for your you. uh, presentation. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you.